This speaker made her debut as one of the first Pokemon, but was removed from the original lineup when she was termed too disturbing for children. <laughs> she then founded a library in the middle of the desert where she collects odds and ends of tech history. And when we asked her to share them with us, she got on top of her giant owl, flew out here, and built a nest in the convention center so she wouldn't be late. I'm very proud to present Nell Shamrell Harrington. <laughs> All right, hello Portland. It is good to be back here. I'm Mel Shemrell Harrington. I'm a software engineer at Chef. I currently live in Seattle, but I'm also a proud graduate of St. Mary's Academy in downtown Portland, Oregon. <laughs> you can email me at nshamrell at chef.io or feel free to tweet me at any time at at Nell Shamrell. So I'm here today to talk to you about the history of DevOps. And when I practiced this talk, someone asked me, well, why are you giving a talk on that? Doesn't everybody already know this? So I thought I'd ask the room. Does anyone here feel they already know the whole history of DevOps? All right, uh, zero hands. Like that, that's the first time I've ever gotten zero hands on that. So the answer is clearly a resounding no. And part of the reason for this is as DevOps has spread throughout our industry, as we've all seen those white papers, we've seen the billboards, I think I saw one in San Francisco saying get yourself some DevOps. DevOps has become over-marketed and I believe over-hyped. And as a result of this, the context of the ideas and principles of DevOps have been lost. And that context is crucial for both understanding and applying DevOps principles. And part of the reason it's easy to lose sight of this context is we are currently swimming in a sea of buzzwords. So some people have taken this to the point of parody. There is DevOps buzzword bingo. Is anyone playing that here today? <laughs> well, if you're not and you want to, uh, go ahead and search that on the Googles and you will find it. There is also DevOps against humanity. So I'm hoping someone printed these cards out and we can play it at the party tonight. Be there. It'll be there. Excellent. So as fun as these parodies are, they illustrate that finding the signal and the noise of anything filled with buzzwords is like trying to find that needle in a haystack. To find that signal and to know how to take ourselves into the DevOps of the present as well as the DevOps of the future, we first need to take a long step back. So I like to always include at least one quote from either Game of Thrones or Star Wars in my presentation. So this is that quote, and that's, to go forward, you must go back. To understand where DevOps is now and where it's going, we first need to understand where it came from. So the purpose of this talk is to highlight the origin and context of these, dev of these DevOps buzzwords and how they are relevant to us now and into the future. So let's start out with what I call a meta buzzword, and that is scale. Now this is what we see a lot, especially when it comes to cloud computing. And the origins go back into the 18th century. Let's step way back into there. And this was the era of craft production. Craft production employed a workforce that was highly skilled in all aspects of the production of goods, including the design, the machine operations, and the fitting. Now, quality was very high, but only a low volume of goods could ever be produced at once. So like many technological and management advances, the concept of scale originated out of war. In 1785, the American Revolution had just ended, and the French Revolution was just about to begin. That meant there was a massive need for weapons in both North America and in Europe. So a man named Henri Blanc, a Frenchman living in Paris, invited some military members and diplomats to his gun shop to demonstrate a new technology. What he showed them was a way to create interchangeable parts that could be fit in multiple guns, rather than every single part needing to be individually fitted for every single gun, which was the uh, norm at that time. So an American you may have heard of named Thomas Jefferson, happened to be at this demonstration, and he brought these ideas back to the fledgling United States. So Eli Whitney, who you might remember from your American history classes as inventing the cotton gin, he was given a government contract to produce 10,000 guns with interchangeable parts in two years. 
well, we didn't finish in two years, or five years, or eight years. It took him 10 years and numerous cost overruns before he was finally able to deliver those guns. Now, even though it took more time and a lot more money than was expected, this played a big part in creating what's called the American system of manufacturing, where standardized parts were assembled into products. It was this standardization that led to mass production at scale. And this would go on to revolutionize more industries, most notably the automobile industry. In 1908, Henry Ford's company produced the Model T car. And what made this car special was that it was designed for mass manufacturing from the ground up. All the parts were fully interchangeable and standardized. And this meant that anyone who could drive one Model T could drive any Model T. Prior to this, people had to be individually trained on cars. Additionally, anyone could repair it. Parts did not have to be individually fitted for each individual car. And along with interchangeable parts, Henry Ford also brought the idea of interchangeable workers. So Ford divided his employees into two groups. There were the assembly workers, who actually assembled the car, and the knowledge workers. Does that term sound familiar? Their job was to think about, design, and orchestrate all the parts of the car to come together without doing the actual assembly. So Ford would later write in his book, Today and Tomorrow, standardization in its true sense is the union of all the best points of commodities with the best points of production to the end that the best commodity may be produced in sufficient quantity and at the least cost to the consumer. So something else Ford noted was that many people thought that machine production would destroy craftsmanship, when exactly the reverse has come about. We now need more expert machinists than we have ever needed. Now, when I saw this quote, it sounded very familiar to me. In fact, Kelsey Hightower just mentioned something similar in his talk just before this one. So has anyone else dealt with the fear that this new way of doing things will cause a lot of people to lose their jobs? It brought me back to the Visible Ops Handbook, specifically this passage, which is that each of the high performers had server system and ratios greater than 100 to 1. In contrast, analysts report that average server system and ratios is between 15 to 1 and 25 to 1. Now, when Visible Ops was first published in 2004, this passage generated a lot of controversy. People saw this and imagined massive layoffs of sysadmins and other technology workers, because why would you need so many sysadmins if you only need one for every hundred servers? So any time a new way of doing things is developed, whether in the early 1900s or in the early 2000s, it always seems to cause a panic that it will lead to massive unemployment. But as both Ford and the authors of Visible Ops demonstrate, it doesn't mean craftspeople or systems become useless. It means their skills are still desperately needed, but they are implemented in a different way. So with that, let's step back to the early 20th century. Now, Ford's mass production system was designed to make huge quantities of a limited number of models. This was one of the limitations of it. One of my favorite quotes from Ford is that any customer can have any car painted any color that he wants as long as it's black. The Model T car was not designed to be customizable. It was designed to be uniform. Now that worked well when a company could count on moving a massive amount of product, but for companies that could not count on this, a new form of manufacturing would need to be developed. And that leads us to our second meta buzzword, which is lean. So let's look at the origins of lean. Lean was originally used to characterize the Japanese approach to automobile manufacturing, which began with a company called Toyota. So let's take a quick look at their history. In 1926 Japan, a man named Sakuchi Toyota started the Toyota Automation Loom Works. Now this was in the days that textiles had to be manufactured on massive looms, and a human being would have to attend each of these looms. Whenever a thread broke, the human would have to reach into the moving machine and reconnect the thread before the machine stopped. Now the problem with this is it was highly dangerous. A lot of people lost limbs. I read a story once about someone whose hair got caught in one of these machines and it ripped it off. So it wasn't really a good way to do things. So Toyota invented a special mechanism that would automatically stop a thread whenever a thread broke. And this leads us to a buzzword called Jidoka, 
which is one of the characteristics of lean production. And what Jidoka means is that it is automation with a human touch. Shigeo Shingo, one of the architects of the now famous Toyota production system, would later write that automation is different from simply mechanizing human movements. He instead advocated for what's called pre-automation. When a machine is pre-automated, it stops and alerts workers whenever abnormalities occur so they can come and fix the problem. If there's not a problem, it just keeps on working. So this also sounded familiar to me. It reminded me of the modern day IT concept of monitoring. Patrick Dubois, who we'll cover more in just a bit, said this in the modern chapter of the book, Web Operations. Ask yourself, does this alert require any immediate intervention? Alert should be actionable. If an alert can be ignored or doesn't require human intervention, the alert is a waste of energy. So monitoring in IT systems is our modern way of applying Jidoka, that automation with a human touch. Although we are making progress on the idea of self-healing machines, we're not quite there yet. For now, we continue to automate as much as we can, but depend on that human touch when needed. So with that, let's step on back into the past, and this time, let's go to the 1930s. In the 1930s, Toyota, which by then had changed its name from Toyota, started pivoting from producing looms to producing automobiles. In fact, in 1929, Kichiro Toyota journeyed across the Pacific Ocean to visit Henry Ford's automobile plant and study his system of production, then bring that back to the Toyota Automation Works in Japan. But there was an interruption to this, and that interruption was World War II, which Japan lost. After the war, throughout the occupation and recovery of Japan, Toyota was facing very different business conditions than Ford was in the US. The market for automobiles in post-war Japan, while it was there, it was much smaller. So Toyota needed to make a variety of vehicles all on the same assembly line. And this led to what's now called the Toyota production system. And one of the hallmarks of this system is it harness flexibility. When describing this leaner, more flexible approach, Jeffrey K. Leiker in his book, The Toyota Way, said, flexibility required marshalling the ingenuity of workers to continually improve processes. So rather than putting the power to design and improve processes in the hands of a few knowledge workers, like Ford did, Toyota placed that decision-making and proposal-making directly in the hands of the workers doing the actual work, which was very different from Ford's system. And this led to our next buzzword, which is Kaizen. Now, I have a sticker on my laptop from when I was doing consulting work at Nordstrom. Nordstrom's engineering department had dedicated itself to building a Kaizen culture. And what this means is Kaizen is the Japanese word for continuous improvement. It's the process of making incremental improvements to achieve a key goal of lean production, which is to eliminate waste. And part of the way to eliminate waste is shifting from an approach where you have two stages of a process, and part stage one, whenever it's done with its material, will push it onto stage two, to what's called Kanban. Does anyone here use a Kanban board in there? We've got a few of those in their work. Yep, this is another famous buzzword. And what makes Kanban different is that in Kanban, when you have step one and step two, step two will pull material from step one only when it is ready for it. Rather than step two pushing that, or step one pushing that material onto step two, whether it's ready for it or not. So this directly led to the concept of another buzzword, which is just in time. Now this is one I hear a lot in, in reference to agile development, pair programming, and more. In the hallmark of just in time, is only doing what is needed, when it is needed, and in the amounts needed. When Toyota started doing this, this meant they wouldn't have massive amounts of excess parts and inventory piling up on the floor next to a station when that station wasn't ready for it. So this also sounded familiar to me. It reminded me of one of our now classic DevOps texts, which is the Phoenix Project. And there's a quote in it that work in progress is the silent killer. The Phoenix Project applies lessons from another classic book, The Goal, to modern IT infrastructure. The Phoenix Project likens work in progress in an IT organization to those excess parts and inventory in a physical production plant. And the problem with work in progress is that as no one has slack time, 
if everyone's constantly chasing down fires, outages, etc., that will just get stuck in the system. It's never going to actually get done. So this will ruin a physical manufacturing plant, having excess inventory piling up all over the place. It will ruin a restaurant. I made pizza when I was in college, and occasionally we would have the oven break, and uncooked pizzas would just pile up, pile up, pile up, pile up, and we eventually have to throw them all away because they go bad. And because it's so hard to see, it will also ruin an IT organization. So one of the solutions to this, to this is Kanban, doing only what is needed when it is needed. So with that, let's go back into the past, and let's reflect just a moment on Toyota. Toyota revolutionized manufacturing through lean production, and Toyota systems would come to the U.S. in the late 20th century. So also in the late 20th century, a new type of manufacturing was rising. Although software existed before the 1970s, it was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that the foundational theories and practices of software engineering were starting to be formed. So at that time, many people had the idea to equate software engineering with physical engineering and borrow as much as possible from the design and building of physical infrastructure. And this led to a buzzword we still hear from time to time called waterfall. So in 1985, the U.S. Department of Defense, which by then was beginning to lean very heavily on software contractors, captured a software development process in one of their official documents. And they laid out a six-stage process. First, there was to be an analysis stage where all the requirements were to be gathered, followed by the preliminary design, followed by the detailed design, followed by the actual coding and unit testing, followed by taking all those components of software and integrating them together, then testing those integrations, and then testing the interfaces of all those components. So notice how the design is expected to come first, followed by all the coding, followed by all the testing. Now, I also want to mention is that yes, in 1970, Winston Royce published an article that appeared to be the founding of the waterfall method. But the thing is, he wasn't recommending it. Royce presented it as a flawed model. Even in this Department of Defense standard, they also mentioned the need for more iterative development. So rather than being presented as the one true way, waterfall was presented as the best way people had of doing things at that time. So one of the main issues with waterfall is that the a physical structure's requirements rarely change once you start actually implementing that physical structure. However, software requirements, as all of us in this room probably know, change constantly. So along came a new methodology and a new buzzword, which is Scrum. In 1995, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber presented a paper called the Scrum Development Process, which outlined this new method of software development. One of the key differences from Waterfall was that Scrum readily acknowledges that software development will always be unpredictable. As written in their paper, Scrum Development Process, the development process is regarded as unpredictable at the onset. And control mechanisms are put in place to manage that unpredictability. So Scrum says that unpredictability in software cannot be avoided. However, it can be managed through certain control mechanisms. And one of these control mechanisms are what are called sprints. Does anyone here use sprints in their daily work? All right, saw so a good number of hands go up. So sprints, as you likely know, are, they reflect that it's impossible to know all the requirements to design a software before you start actually implementing it. So this doesn't mean that there's no design at all. I've worked on projects that attend this, attempted to start with no design, and it didn't turn out well. They say that there needs to be a minimal design, and that design needs to be constantly refined as the project goes on. So the goal of each time-locked iterative development cycle is to deliver working software, as Peter Verhal put it in his article, To Agility and Beyond. So Scrum in part led to our next buzzword, and this one's a big one, and that is Agile, specifically the capital A Agile framework. And Agile came out of the Extreme Programming Project, which was started in 1996. A lot like Scrum, it emphasized iterative development, working software, and team empowerment. Now, in 2000, several leaders of this Extreme Programming Project met in Oregon, where they discussed issues within Extreme Programming and various methods, trying to figure out which was the one best method. So in 2001, they came back together in Utah and wrote what's now known as the Agile Manifesto. 
And along with that manifesto, which if you're curious, go ahead and Google search it online, it's all available there. They also established certain agile principles, and I want to highlight just a few of them. The first is that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Agile puts a focus on the customer and the concept of delivering value both early and continuously. Additionally, Agile welcomes changing requirements even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. So like Scrum, and remember Agile did partially emerge out of Scrum, it was designed for changing requirements from the beginning. It didn't try to deny them or minimize those changes. It welcomed and embraced them and actually used them for competitive advantage. And finally, another critical principle states that working software is the primary measure of process. It defines progress not in lines of code or numbers of features, but in the actual working software. Under Agile, it doesn't matter how snazzy a piece of software is intended to be. If it doesn't work, it doesn't count. At the time, this was revolutionary, and I'd argue that's still revolutionary today. So it was Agile that led, led to our next buzzword, perhaps the ultimate buzzword here in an event like this, and that is DevOps. When I was researching this presentation, I put on Twitter, uh, what are your favorite or least favorite DevOps buzzwords? And within a second, someone immediately responded with DevOps. <laughs> okay. So in 2007, Patrick Dubois, a man in Belgium, was working in IT, and he had to constantly straddle the connection between the development team and the operations team. And there was a massive cost to this, both in terms of time and in terms of the mental effort of switching back and forth between the two. So in 2008, he presented Agile Operation Infrastructure. How infra-agile are you? Now there's no video of this presentation, but the paper that accompanied it is freely available online. And in it, he describes a company whose circumstances likely sound familiar to us all. And then as development and infrastructure would work in isolation and would integrate just before the political deadline. There was no time left to fix things. Now for one particular project, a company he was working for decided to try something different. And that was to apply these agile concepts which were being applied to software to the process of putting together infrastructure. During the project, every sprint, they would have a new working release and it would constantly improve. And this was not limited to the application code, like Agile advocates for. It, was also, it also applied to the infrastructure engineering. And even after the application went live, every release, they would continue to improve both the software and the infrastructure. One of the highlights of, of DevOps is that it's never really done. We're constantly, continuously improving an application throughout that application's life cycle, bringing back the concept of Kaizen. So after a few case studies like this one, Dubois laid out three layers of Agile infrastructure. And the first was the technical layer, which is the hardware and software used in the environment. Next is the project layer, which is the process that introduces changes into this environment. And then there's the operations layer, which is the process of keeping that environment working. So notice that technology is only one factor of these three layers. In DevOps marketing, I've noticed that there tends to be a focus on the technology efforts of it. So the technology part is the easy part. It's the processes and maintaining those processes and the cultural elements that are much harder. So in 2009, John Oswald and Paul Hammond explored these in their presentation, 10 plus deploys per day, DevOps cooperation at Flickr. Has anyone seen the video of this presentation? This one is available online. Got a few hands up. I recommend checking it out if you have a moment. So in it, they define one of the primary sources of tension between developers and operators when things go wrong. The first is that ops would say, it's not my machines, it's your code. Dev would respond with, it's not my code, it's your machines. So the traditional thinking then, and we still see this today, was that devs would add new features while ops job was to keep the site reliable and stable. Now this makes it sound like development teams and operations teams not only have separate jobs, but jobs that directly oppose each other. When in fact, ops and dev have the same ultimate job, and that is to enable the business to function. 
And the reality of working in a business, whether it's healthcare, whether it's government work, whether it's your traditional corporate enterprise or your startup, is that all businesses require change. If a business is standing still, it will be overtaken. The problem with change is that change involves risk. And this risk cannot just be owned by the operations team. This is one of the key in insights of DevOps. Rather, both Dev and Ops must own this risk through culture and tools. Now again, notice that culture is first on that list. Something that all Paul and Hannah made clear was that tools will not help you if you install them and still have an argumentative culture going on. It's really easy to get caught up looking for that silver bullet that will solve all of your problems. In my work at Chef, I've had customers come up to me expecting me to engineer some sort of system that will make all the problems go away and make their business easy. And I have to disappoint them. Because success comes first and foremost from the way your employees treat each other. DevOps highlights this, but this is not a new concept. Toyota knew this a long time ago, but it is one we seem to have to continuously rediscover. All the technology in the world will not save you if you lack a culture of respect and human decency. Something I like to say is that technical skills are cultural skills are technical skills. You can't have one without the other and be successful. So one of the best places to discuss this interaction of an intricate relationship between culture and tools are DevOps Days events like this one. So in 2009, the first DevOps Days event was held in Ghent, Belgium. And in 2010, the first DevOps Days event in the US was held. So after this, DevOps Days began to spread around the world. They, more than any other tool, technology, or marketing drive, they showed how hungry people and organizations are to do IT in a better way. Now, along with the conversation at DevOps Days events, the conversation on Twitter was also taking off with the DevOps hashtag. Now, although the concepts of DevOps have been forming for some time, it was in 2009 and 2010 that they seemed to finally strike a nerve in IT practitioners and organizations worldwide. So that brings us pretty close to today, to 2016, where, as I mentioned, we find ourselves in that haze of DevOps buzzwords and marketing hype. So I hope this presentation has helped you find a little bit of the signal in that noise by knowing where these concepts came from. As I wrap up, what I want you to take away is that buzzwords will come and go, as they come and go throughout all of history. But those ideals of producing the best product for a consumer in the most humane and engaging way for employees, those ideals have stayed the same. They have not changed, even over the centuries. The implementations of these ideals have evolved, and they will continue to evolve, from the craft production of the 1800s to the automobile production lines of the 20th century to the software and technology movements of Agile and DevOps today. And they will continue to evolve. They must continue to evolve. In order to continue to evolve, they must continue to be nurtured and cultivated in the way that we apply them, both in our businesses of today and beyond. So here's the call to action. History has carried the torch for us this far. Now it's your turn to carry that torch. Carry these ideals onward in your business, in technology, and beyond. Thank you. Don't fear the Reaper, you should fear Joe. <laughs>